This audio presentation of Bible Mystery and Bible Meaning by Thomas Troward is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2012. All rights reserved. Chapter 1. Creation. Emancipation. The Bible is the book of the emancipation of man. The emancipation of man means his delivery from sorrow and sickness, from poverty, struggle and uncertainty, from ignorance and limitation, and finally from death itself. This may appear to be what the colloquialism of the day would call a tall order, but nevertheless it is impossible to read the Bible with a mind unwarped by antecedent conceptions derived from traditional interpretations without seeing that this is exactly what it promises and what it professes to contain the secret whereby this happy condition of perfect liberty may be attained. Jesus says that if a man keeps his saying, he shall never see death. John 8.51 in the book of Job, we are told that if man has with him a messenger, an interpreter, he shall be delivered from going down to the pit, and shall return to the days of his youth. Job 33, 23-25 The Psalms speak of our renewing of our youth. Psalm 103, 5 And yet again we are told in Job that by acquainting ourselves with God, we shall be at peace. We shall lay up gold as dust and have plenty of silver. We shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto us. Job twenty two twenty one through 28 Now, what I propose is that we shall reread the Bible on the supposition that Jesus and those speakers really meant what they said. Of course, from the standpoint of the traditional interpretation, this is a startling proposition. The traditional explanation assumes that it is impossible for these things to be literally true and therefore it seeks some other meaning in the words, and so gives them a spiritual interpretation. But in the same manner we may spiritualize away an act of Parliament, and it hardly seems the best way of getting at the meaning of the book to follow the example of the preacher who commenced his discourse with the words, Beloved brethren, the text doth not mean what it saith. Let us, however, start with the supposition that these texts do mean what they say, and try and interpret the Bible on these lines it will at least have the attraction of novelty, and I think if the reader gives his careful attention to the following pages, he will see that his method carries with it the conviction of reason. Truth, Knowledge, and Reason If a thing is true at all, there is a way in which it is true, and when the way is seen we find it to be perfectly reasonable with, before we understand the way appeared unreasonable. We all go by railroad now, Yet they were esteemed level-headed practical men in their day who proposed to confine George Stephenson, English inventor of the early steam-driven railway engine, as a lunatic for saying that it was possible to travel at 30 miles an hour. The first thing to notice is that there is a common element running through the text I have quoted. They all contain the idea of acquiring certain information, and the promised results are all contingent on the getting this information and using it. Jesus says it depends on our keeping his saying, that is, receiving the information which we had to give and act upon. Job says that it depends on rightly interpreting a certain message, and again that it depends on our making ourselves acquainted with something, and the context of the passage from the Psalms makes it clear that the deliverance from death and the renewal of life there promised are to be attained through the ways which the Lord made known unto Moses. In all these passages we find that these wonderful results come from the attainment of certain knowledge, and the Bible therefore appeals to our reason. From this point of view we may speak of the science of the Bible, and as we advance in our study we shall find that this is not a misuse of terms, for the Bible is eminently scientific, only its science is not primarily physical but mental. The Bible contemplates man as composed of spirit, soul, and body or in other words, as combining into a single unity a threefold nature, spiritual, psychic, and corporeal. And the knowledge which is proposed to give us is the knowledge of the true relation between these three factors. The Bible also contemplates the totality of all being manifested and unmanifested, as likewise constituting a threefold unity, which may be distributed under the terms God, man, and the universe and it occupies itself with telling us of the interaction, both positive and negative, which goes on between these three. Furthermore, it bases this interaction upon two great psychological laws, namely that of the creative power of thought, and that of the amenability of thought to control of suggestion, and it affirms that this creative power is as innately inherent in man's thought as in the divine thought. 
but it also shows how through ignorance of these truths we unknowingly misuse our creative power, and so produce the evils we deplore. And it also realizes the extreme danger of recognizing our power before we have attained the moral qualities which will fit us to seize in accordance with the principles which keep the great totality of things in an abiding harmony. And to avoid this danger, the Bible veils its ultimate meaning under symbols, allegories, and parables. But these are so framed as to reveal the ultimate meaning to those who will take the trouble to compare the various statements with one another, and who are sufficiently intelligent to draw the deductions which follow from thus putting two and two together, while those who cannot thus read between the lines are trained into the requisite obedience suited to the present extent of their capacity, and are thus gradually prepared for the fuller recognition of the truth as they advance. Involution and Evolution Seen in this light, the Bible is found not to be a mere collection of old-world fables or unintelligible dogmas, but a statement of great universal laws, all of which proceed simply and naturally from the initial truth that creation is a process of evolution. Grant the evolutionary theory, which every advance in modern science renders clear, and all the rest follows. For the entire Bible is based upon the principle of evolution. But the Bible is a statement of universal law, of that which obtains in the realm of the invisible, as well as that which obtains in the realm of the visible, and therefore it deals with the facts of the transcendental nature as well as those of the physical plane. And accordingly it contemplates an earlier process anterior to evolution, the process namely of involution, the passing of spirit into form as antecedent to the passing of form into consciousness. If we bear this in mind, it will throw light on many passages, which must remain wrapped in impenetrable obscurity, until we know something of the psychic principles to which they refer. The fact that the Bible always contemplates evolution, as necessarily preceded by involution, should never be lost sight of, and therefore much of the Bible requires to be read as referring to the involuntary process taking place under the psychic plane. But involution and evolution are not opposed to one another. They are only the earlier and later stages of the same process. The perpetual urging onward of spirit for self-expression in infinite varieties of form. And therefore the grand foundation which the whole Bible system is built up is the spirit, which is thus continually passing into manifestation, is always the same spirit. In other words, it is only one. These two fundamental truths the under whatever varieties of form, the spirit is only one. And at the creation of all forms, and consequently of the whole world of conscious relation, is the result of spirit's one mode of action, which is thought, are the basis of all that the Bible has to teach us. And therefore, from its first page to its last, we shall find these two ideas continually recurring in a variety of different connections, the oneness of the divine spirit and the creative power of man's thought, which the Bible expresses as two grand statements, that God is one, and that man is made in the image and likeness of God. These are the two fundamental statements of the Bible, and all of its other statements flow logically from them. And since the whole argument of Scripture is built up from these premises, the reader must not be surprised at the frequency with which your analysis of that argument will bring us back to these two initial propositions. So far from being a vain repetition, this continual reduction of the statement of the Bible to the premise with which it originally sets out is the strongest proof that we have in them a sure and solid foundation on which to base our present life and our future expectations. Exclusivity But there is yet another point of view from which the Bible appears to be the very opposite of a logically accurate system built up on the broad foundations of natural law. From this point of view, it first looks like the egotistical and arrogant tradition of a petty tribe, the narrow book of a narrow sect, instead of a statement of universal truth. And yet this aspect of it is so prominent that it can by no means be ignored. It is impossible to read the Bible and shut our eyes to the fact that it tells us of God making a covenant with Abraham, and thenceforward separating his descendants by a divine interposition from the remainder of mankind. For this separation of a certain portion of the race as special objects of the divine favor forms an integral part of Scripture, from the story of Cain and Abel to the description of the camp of the saints in the beloved city in the book of Revelation. 
We cannot separate these two aspects of the Bible, for they are so interwoven with one another that if we attempt to do so, we shall end by having no Bible left, and we are therefore compelled to accept the Bible statements as a whole or reject it altogether, so that we are met by the paradox of a combination between an all-inclusive system of natural law and exclusive selection which at first appears to flatly contradict the process of nature. Is it possible to reconcile the two? The answer is that it is not only possible, but that this exclusive selection is a necessary consequence of the universal law of evolution when working in the higher phases of individualism. It is not that those who do not come within a pale of this selection suffer any diminution, but that these who do come within it receive thereby a special augmentation, and as we shall see by and by, this takes place by a purely natural process resulting from the more intelligent employment of that knowledge which it is the purpose of the Bible to unfold to us. These two principles of the inclusive and the exclusive are intertwined in a double thread which runs through all Scripture, and this dual nature of its statement must always be borne in mind, if we would apprehend its meaning. Asking the reader, therefore, to carefully go over these preliminary marks as affording the clue to the reason of the Bible statements, I shall now turn to the first chapter of Genesis. Beginning The opening announcement that, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, contains a statement of the first of these two propositions, which are the fundamental premise from which the whole Bible has evolved. From the Master's instruction to the woman of Samaria, we know that God means spirit, not a spirit, as in the authorized King James Version, thus narrowing the divine being with the limitations of individuality, but as it stands in the original Greek, simply spirit, that is, all spirit, or spirit in the universal. Thus the opening words of the Bible may be read, In the beginning spirit, which is a statement of the underlying universal unity. Here let me draw attention to the twofold meaning of the words in the beginning. They may mean first in order of time or first in order of causation. And the latter meaning is brought out by the Latin version, which commences with the words in principio, that is, in principle. This distinction should be borne in mind, for in all subsequent stages of evolution, the initial principle which gives rise to the individualized entity must still be in operation as the phone et origio, fountain and origin of that particular manifestation just as much as it is in the first concentration. It is the root of the individuality, without which the individuality would cease to exist. It is the beginning of the individuality in order of causation, and this beginning is therefore a continuous fact always present and not to be conceived of as something which has been left behind and done with. The same principle was, of course, the beginning of the entity in point of time also, however far back in the ages we may suppose it to have first evolved into separate existence, so that whether we apply the idea to the cosmos or to the individual, the words in the beginning, both carry us back to the primordial outpush from non-manifestation into manifestation, and also rivet our attention upon the same power as still at work as a causal principle both in ourselves and in everything else around us. In both these senses, then, the opening words of the Bible tell us that the beginning of everything is God, or Spirit in the universal. Heaven and Earth The next statement, that God created the heaven and the earth, brings us to the consideration of the Bible way of using words. The fact that the Bible deals with spiritual and psychic matters makes it of necessity an esoteric book, and therefore in common with all other esoteric literatures. It makes a symbolic use of words for the purpose of succinctly expressing ideas which would otherwise require elaborate explanation, and also for the purpose of concealing its meaning from those who are not yet safely to be entrusted with it. But this need not discourage the earnest student. For by comparing one part of the Bible with another, he will find that the Bible itself affords a clue to the translation of its own symbolical vocabulary. Here, as in so many other instances, the Master has given us the key to the right interpretation. He says that the kingdom of heaven is within us. In other words, that heaven is the kingdom of the innermost and spiritual. And if so, 
then by necessary implication, earth must be the symbol of the opposite extreme and must metaphorically mean the outermost in material. We are starting the history of the evolution of the world in which we live, that is to say this power, which the Bible calls God, is first presented to us in the opening words of Genesis, at a stage immediately preceding the commencement of a stupendous work. Now what are the conditions necessary for doing any work? Obviously there must be something that works and something that is worked upon, an active and a passive factor, an energy and a material on or which that energy operates. This, then, is what is meant by the creation of heaven and earth. It is the operation of the eternally subsisting one upon itself which produces its dual expression as energy and substance. And here remark carefully that this does not mean a separation, for energy can only be exhibited by reason of something which is energized, or in other words, for life to manifest at all, there must be something that lives. This is an all-important truth, for our conception of ourselves as being separate from the divine life is the root of all our troubles. In its first verse, therefore, the Bible starts us with the conception of energy, or life inherent in substance, and shows us that the two constitute a dual unity, which is the first manifestation of the infinite unmanifested one. And if the reader will think these things out for himself, he will see that these are primary intuitions the contrary of which it is impossible to conceive. He may, if he please, introduce a demurg as part of the machinery for the production of the world, but then he has to account for this demurg which brings him back to the undistributed one of which I speak. And its first manifestation as energy inherent in substance, and if he is driven back to his position, then it becomes clear that a demurg is totally unnecessary wheel in a train of evolutionary machinery, and the gratuitous introduction of a factor which does no work but what could equally be done without is contrary to anything we can observe in nature or can conceive of of self-evolving power. Form But we are particularly cautioned against the mistake of supposing that substance is the same thing as form, for we are told that the earth was without form. This is important because it is just here that a very prolific source of error in metaphysics studies creeps in. We see forms which, simply as masses, are devoid of any organized life corresponding to the particular form, and therefore we deny the inherency of energy or life in ultimate substance itself, as well deny the pungency of pepper because it is not in a particular pepper pot we are accustomed to. No, that primordial state of substance with which the opening verse of the Bible is concerned is something far more removed from any conception we can have of matter as formed into atoms or electrons. We are here only at the first stage of involution, and the presence of material atoms is a stage, and by no means the earliest in the process of evolution. Movement We are next told that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here we have two factors, spirit and water, and the initial movement is attributed to spirit. This first introduces us to that particular mode of manifestation of the universal substance, which we may denominate the psychic. The psychic mode of the universal substance may best be described as cosmic soul essence, not indeed universal in the strictest sense, otherwise than is usually included in the original primordial essence but universal to the particular world system under formation and as yet undifferentiated into any individual form. This is what the medieval writers spoke of as the soul of the universe, or anima mundi, as distinguished from the divine self, or animus dei, and it is the universal psychic medium in which the nuclei of the forms hereafter to become consolidate on the plane of the concrete and material take their inception and obedience to the movement of the spirit or thought. This is the realm of potential forms, and is the connecting link between spirit or pure thought and matter or concrete form, and as such plays the most important part in the constitution of the cosmos and of man. Distributive Medium in our reading of the Bible, as well as in our practical application of mental science, the existence of this intermediary between spirit and matter must never be lost sight of. We may call it the distributive medium, 
in passing through which the hitherto undistributed energy of spirit receives differentiation of direction, and so ultimately produces differentiation of forms and relations on the outermost or visible plane. This is the cosmic element, which is esoterically called water, and so long ago as the reign of Henry the Seventh, Dean Collaire explains it thus in a letter to his friend Randolph. Dean Collet was very far from being a visionary. He was one of the precursors of the Reformation in England, and among the first to establish the study of Greek at Oxford, and as the founder of St. Paul's School in London, he took a leading part in introducing the system of public school education, which is still in operation in this country. There is no mistaking Dean Collet for any other than a thoroughly level-headed and practical man, and his opinion as to the meaning of the word water and his connection, therefore, carries great weight. But we have the utterance of a yet higher authority on this subject, for the master himself concentrates his whole instruction to Nicodemus on the point that the new birth results from the interaction of spirit and water, especially emphasizing the fact that the flesh has no share. In the operation, this distinction between the flesh or the outermost principle and water should be carefully noted. The emphasis laid by the master on the nothingness of the flesh and the essentialness of water must mark a distinction of the most important kind and we shall find it very helpful in unraveling the meaning of many passages of the Bible to grasp this distinction at the outset. The action of spirit upon water is that of an active upon a passive principle, and the result of any sort of work is to reconstruct the material worked upon into a form which it did not possess before. Now the new form to be produced, whatever it may be, is a result, and therefore is not to be enumerated among the cause of its own production. Hence it is self-obvious truism that any act of creative power must take place at a more interior level than that of the form to be created, and accordingly, whether in the Old or the New Testament, the creative action is always contemplated as taking place between the spirit and the water. Whether we are thinking of producing a new world or a new man, we must always go back to first cause, operating on primary substance. Light we are told the first product of the movement of spirit upon water was light, thereby suggesting an analogy with the discovery of modern science that light and heat are modes of motion. But the statement that the sun was not created till the fourth day guards us against the mistake of supposing that what is here meant is the light visible to the physical eye. Rather, it is the all-pervading inner light, of which I shall have more to say by and by and which only becomes visible as a corresponding sense of inward vision begins to be developed. It is that psychic condition of the universal substance in which the auras of the potentials of all forms may be discovered, and where, consciously or unconsciously, the spirit determines the forms of those which are to be. Like all other knowledge, the knowledge of the inner light is capable of application at higher and lower levels, and the premature recognition of its power at the lower levels, uncontrolled by the recognition of its higher phases, is one of the most dangerous acquisitions, but duly regulated by the higher knowledge, the lower is both safe and legitimate, for in its due order it also is part of the universal harmony. Differentiation the initial light having thus been produced, the introduction of the firmament on the second day indicates the separation of the spiritual principles of the different members of the world system from one another, and the third day sees the emanation of earth from the water or the production of the actual corporeal system of nature. The commencement of the process of evolution, up to this point the action has been entirely upon the inner plane of water that is to say, a process of involution, and consistently with this it is impossible for the heavenly bodies to begin giving physical light until the fourth day, for until then no physical sun or planets could have existed. With the fourth day, however, the physical universe is differentiated into shape, and on the fifth day the terrestrial waters begin to take their share in the evolutionary process by spontaneously producing fish and fowl. And here we may remark in passing how Genesis has forestalled modern science in the discovery that birds are anatomically more closely related to fishes than to land animals. The terrestrial earth, I call it so to distinguish it from symbolic earth, already on the third day impregnated with the vegetable principle, 
takes up the evolutionary work on the sixth day, producing all those other animal races which have not already originated in the waters and the preparation of the world as an abode for man is completed. It would be difficult to give a more concise statement of evolution. Originating spirit subsists at first a simple unity. Then it differentiates itself into the active and passive principles spoken of as heaven and earth, or spirit and water. From these proceed light and the separation into their respectable spheres of the spiritual principles on the different planets, each carrying with it the potential of the self-reproducing power. Then we pass into the realm of realization, and the work that has been done on the interior planes is now reproduced in physical manifestation, thus marking a still further unfoldment, and finally, in the phrases, let the waters bring forth, and let the earth bring forth. The land and water of our habitable globe are distinctly stated to be the sources from which all vegetable and animal forms have been evolved. Thus creation is described as a self-transforming action of the one, unanalyzable spirit, passing by successive transitions into all the varieties of manifestations that fill the universe. Days of Creation And here we may notice a point which has puzzled commentators unacquainted with the principles on which the Bible is written. This is the expression, the evening and the morning were the first, second, etc. day. Why, it is asked, does each day begin with the evening? And various attempts have been made to explain it in accordance with Jewish methods of reckoning time. But as soon as we see that the Bible's statements of creation is, the reason at once becomes clear. The second verse of the Bible tells us that the starting point was darkness, and the coming forth of light out of darkness cannot be stated in any other order than the dawning of morning from night. It is the dawning into manifestation out of non-manifestation, and this happens at each successive stage of the evolutionary process. We should notice also that nothing is said as to the remainder of each day. All that we hear of each day is the morning, thus indicating the grand truth that when once a divine day opens, it never again descends into the shades of night. It is always morning. The spiritual sun is always climbing higher and higher, but never passes a zenith or commences to decline, a truth which Swedenborg expresses by saying that the spiritual sun is always seen in the eastern heavens at an angle of 45 degrees above the horizon. What a glorious and inspiring truth! When once God begins a work, that work will never cease, but will go on forever expanding into more and more radiant forms of strength and beauty, because it is the expression of the infinite, which is itself love, wisdom, and power. These days of creation are still in their prime and forever will be so, and the germs of the new heaven and the new earth which the Bible promises are already maturing in the heavens and earth that now are, as St. Paul tells us, waiting only for the manifestation of the sons of God to follow up the old principle of evolution to still further expansion in the glory that shall be revealed. Man as himself included in a great whole, man is no exception to the universal law of evolution. It has often been remarked that the account of this creation is twofold, the two statements being contained in the first and second chapters of Genesis respectively. But this is precisely in accordance with the method adopted regarding the rest of creation. First we are told of the creation in the realm of the invisible and psychic, that is to say the process of involution, and afterwards we are told of the creation on the plane of concrete and material, that is to say, the process of evolution. And since involution is the cause and evolution the effect, the Bible observes this order both in the account of the creation of the world and in that of the creation of man. In regard to his physical structure, man's body, we are told, is formed from the earth, that is, by a combination of the same material elements as all other concrete forms, and thus in the physical man, the evolutionary process attains its culmination in the production of a material vehicle capable of serving as a starting point for a further advance, which is now to be made on the intellectual and spiritual. The principle of evolution is never departed from, but its further action now includes the intelligent cooperation of the evolving individuality itself, as a necessary factor in the work. The development of merely animal man is a spontaneous operation of nature, 
but the development of the mental man can only result from his own recognition of the law of self-expression of spirit as operating in himself. It is therefore for the setting forth of man's power to use this law that the Bible is written, and accordingly the great fact on which it seeks to rivet our attention in its first utterance regarding man is that he is made in the image and likeness of God. A very little reflection will show us that this likeness cannot be in the outward form, for the universal spirit in which all things subsist cannot be limited by space. It is a principle permeating all things as their innermost substance and vivifying energy. And of it the Bible tells us that in the beginning there was nothing else. The Creative Power of Thought Now the one and only conception we can have of this universal life principle is that of the creative power producing infinitely varied expressions of itself by thought. For we cannot ascribe any other initial mode of movement to spirit but that of thought. Although it is taking place in the universal, this mode of thought must necessarily be, relatively to the individual in particular, a subconscious activity. The likeness, therefore, between God and man must be a mental likeness. And since the only fact which up to this point the Bible has told us regarding the universal mind is its creative power, the resemblance indicated can only consist in the reproduction of the same creative power in the mind of man. As we progress, we shall find that the whole Bible turns on this one fundamental fact. The creative power is inherent in our thought, and we can by no means divest ourselves of it. But because we are ignorant that we possess this power, or because we misapprehend the conditions for its beneficial employment, we need much instruction in nature of our own as yet unrecognized possibilities, and it is the purpose of the Bible to give us this teaching. A little consideration on the terms of the evolutionary process will show us that since there is no other source from which it can proceed, the individual mind, which is the essential entity that we call man, can be no other than a concentration of the universal mind into individual consciousness. Man's mind is, therefore, a miniature reproduction of the divine mind, just as fire has always the same igneous qualities whether the center of combustion be large or small. And so it is on this fact that the Bible would fix our attention from first to last, knowing that if the interior realm of causation be maintained in a harmonious manner, the external realm of effects is certain to exhibit corresponding health, happiness, and beauty. And further, if the human mind is the exact image and likeness of the divine, then its creative power must be equally unlimited. Its mode is different, being directed to the individual in particular, but its quality is the same. And this becomes evident if we reflect that it is not possible to set any limit to thought, and that its only limitations are such as are set by limited conceptions of the individual who thinks. And it is precisely here that the difficulty comes in. Our thought must necessarily be limited by our conceptions. We cannot think of something which we cannot conceive, and therefore the more limited our conception, the more limited will be our thought, and its creations will accordingly be limited in a corresponding degree. Purpose of Education It is for this reason that the ultimate purpose of all true instruction is to lead us into the divine light, where we shall see things beyond the range of any past experiences, things which have not yet emerged into the heart of man to conceive, revealing of the divine spirit opening in us untold worlds of splendor, delight, and unending achievement. But in our earlier stages of development, where we are still surrounded by the midst of ignorance, this correspondence between the range of thought creations and the range of our conceptions brings about the catastrophe of the fall, which forms a subject of the next chapter. End of chapter.